Hey there, and welcome to The Gathering. My name is Maddie. I am the online pastor here, and I want to thank you for joining us in worship today. If this is your first time checking out our channel, be sure to subscribe before you leave. Sermons like the one we're about to watch and listen to together come out every Sunday and are available on demand all week long. We also have other videos, YouTube shorts, all kinds of content that roll out on this page, so subscribe, that way you don't miss anything. You can also head to the description of this video to see links to our website to learn more about our church, links to give if you're interested in doing that today, and a link to fill out a connect card. That lets me know that you're here and gives me the chance to reach out, say hello, and help connect you to online community. All right, that's all I got. That's housekeeping for our time together. So I hope you enjoy this message, and if you do, be sure to share it with your friends. I don't know how your May is going, but mine has been crazy. I've had some kind of event or social outing like every day of the week, it feels like. And I remember in March and April watching as my May weekends just got progressively more full with baby showers and graduation parties and birthdays. I had a colleague tell me that her friends were calling this like may simber because it started to feel a little bit like the holiday season in the middle of May, and I felt that like in my spirit. And I was reflecting on this last week when I came home in the morning to my first fully free day in like weeks. And I walked through the door and I took a look around and I realized that my place was a disaster. It was awful. It needed some serious love. In all my running around and socializing, I had completely failed to keep up with my own house. And so that upkeep and what it took to make it a place that felt welcoming, that got totally put on the back burner. The dishes had piled up. My laundry desperately needed to be done. I was running out of clothes to wear. And I needed to vacuum like every inch of my house. And this was really disappointing. Like all I wanted to do on that day was to lay low. But I knew that if I were to be complacent in the state of my house, I wouldn't actually be able to rest. I would feel a little anxious the whole day. So to find that peace that I really wanted on my one day free, I had to write my environment. So I busted out the Clorox and I got to cleaning. Today we're continuing on in our series on comfortable truths, and we're taking a look today at the book of Haggai. And if there's anything that I picked up in reading this book, it was that even the ancient Israelites had to get their house in order. It wasn't just me. They had to do it too. Just two chapters long, the author of Haggai tells us how God used the prophet to challenge the Israelites to prioritize God together as they settle into life after years of being forced into exile. Now last week, Pastor Matt gave a little bit of context about what was happening in Israel at the time that Haggai was written. So I 100% encourage you to go back and to check out that message for more detail. But here are the cliff notes. 85 years before we jump into our story in the city of Jerusalem, we see this community overtaken by another nation. This outside force swept in, they destroyed the temple, they destroyed the city of Jerusalem, and they forcibly expelled and kidnapped the wealthy and important people, sending them into exile. Now, the destruction of the temple in particular is significant to our story today. Because for them, God physically lived inside that temple. So destroying it meant cutting their tie and their connection to God. It was catastrophic for a community that lived so relationally with their God. And so our story today starts almost 20 years after that exile was lifted and the Israelites have returned back to Jerusalem. City leaders were doing pretty well for themselves, but their community was struggling and the temple had not been rebuilt yet. And if one stopped and really took a look around, they might recognize a house in disarray. Through the prophetic words of Haggai, God challenges those leaders to reconstruct the temple and to reprioritize the community's relationship with God. And it's here that we step into the story, reading what Haggai had to say in chapter 1, verses 7 through 11. It says this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider how you have fared. 
Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You have looked for much, but it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because my house lies in ruins while all of you hurry off to your own houses. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the lands and on the hills on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, on the soil, and what it produces on humans and animals and on all their labors. In sitting down with Jewish leaders, Haggai offers up an uncomfortable truth about their relationship to God. They've grown complacent, neglectful even. And the reality is that that truth isn't just reserved for the ancient Israelites in this story. It's also true often about us today. I will be the first to admit that I often fall into a rut of complacency in my spiritual life. Because the uncomfortable truth is that it isn't difficult to grow neglectful of our relationship with God. In fact, I would argue that it is incredibly easy. I mean, life is happening, and it doesn't stop happening. In the wise words of everyone's favorite song in Shrek, written by the band Smash Mouth, the years start coming and they don't stop coming. (laughs) I couldn't help it. I had to work a Shrek reference in somewhere. But the reality is that by the time our schedules fill up and our workload packs on, if we haven't been intentional with our faith, it is one of the simplest things to watch slip onto the back burner. And then we find ourselves in a faith that feels stiff and stale. The desire to rebuild and reconnect with God bubbles up, and we're not even really sure where to begin. Similar to the characters in our story who neglected rebuilding their connection with God, we can also struggle to take that first step. And in those moments, I believe that there are three kinds of spirituality that we encounter. A spirituality that is stuck, a spirituality that is self-centered, and a spirituality that is sentimental. Each of us will likely experience a faith that is stuck or self-centered or sentimental throughout our lives. God offers us a way to move beyond each of them because their ultimate goal is to gracefully call us back to relationship over and over again. The first kind of spiritual expression that I think we encounter when we are trying to reprioritize our relationship with God is a spirituality that is stuck, a stuck spirituality. I like to refer to this one as like spiritual task paralysis for my neurodivergent and ADHD friends out there. Sometimes we look around and we see all the work that needs to be done, and it is exhausting to think about. There is so much we feel like we have to do as we rebuild that relationship that we're incapable of taking a first step. And the Israelites certainly felt this kind of pressure. I mean, rebuilding the temple was not something that was going to happen overnight. It was likely a task that was going to take several decades to complete. That's overwhelming. Like, I imagine they kind of looked around and were like, where do we even begin? And what I love about Haggai's prophecy to them is that God kind of gets it, you know? God acknowledges this. Right at the beginning, they say, go up to the hills and bring the wood down to build the house. Go up to the hills and bring wood, is what it says. The first thing God does when calling them back into relationship is offer them a first step. Just start by grabbing the wood. Friends, God knows that reprioritizing our faith after a season where you have felt complacent or distant can be overwhelming, especially if it feels like we've been neglecting that relationship for a bit because we might set the expectation for ourselves that we have to pick right back up where we left off. But God invites you to just take one small step into community, to consider one thing that feels right for you today, and to lean into that practice among other people. 
Perhaps for you, it, it looks like getting back into a routine on worshiping with other people on Sunday morning. You could pick a Sunday, invite someone to watch or attend with you. Or for the extroverts out there who like to make a friend, when you're sitting in person, you could get the name of whoever is sitting next to you and ask if they want to sit together next Sunday. Or maybe it looks like re-engaging the habit of prayer in your life by praying in the car on the way home, which is my personal favorite time to chat with God uninterrupted. But instead of focusing those prayers inward, you could turn them outward and pray for your community or people that you love. When we've been neglecting our relationship with God and we feel stuck, sometimes the first step to rebuilding that connection is engaging familiar practices that are centered around community. Just as the Israelites were instructed to rebuild the temple together, we're encouraged to break out of stagnant seasons of faith alongside other people. God doesn't need us to rebuild the whole temple alone or overnight. Just take a step. Start somewhere. Go up the hill and grab the wood. The second kind of spiritual expression that we might encounter in this process is that of a self-centered spirituality. A self-centered spirituality. Last week, Pastor Matt talked about the prophet Joel and his reminder that we are not called to live individual lives, but that we are responsible to one another. We're tied together in an inescapable network of mutuality, as the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said. And yet, the trap of a spirituality that is individualistic is another very simple one for us to fall into. And we see it in this story with the governor and the high priest. Haggai's uncomfortable truth pops up at a time where their desire to rebuild the temple was like kind of half-hearted at best. You know, the characters in the story were really more interested in their own needs and comforts and less interested in reestablishing a place for God to dwell within their community. And it was having a negative impact on them. For us modernly, I think this is what we experience when we're practicing a faith that's centered around our own personal growth rather than a faith that we grow in together. God calls us to the kind of faith that is communal, a faith that doesn't solely revolve around what we might benefit from, but one that is centered on helping others see how God is moving in our midst. So rather than living a life that's focused on self, God calls us to an others-centered spirituality. And I think we can do this in a variety of ways. One of the best ways that we center our spirituality on others is just by showing up. Sometimes our very presence is what allows someone to experience God in a new way. And I know that that seems strange or kind of hard to imagine, um, but sometimes that's it. Sometimes it's just being in the room that opens the door for the Spirit of God to transform and to move in another person's life. And so, Maybe you choose to just prioritize presence in your faith. Maybe it looks like re-engaging with that core group or, or showing up maybe even on those days where you're just feeling kind of blech about it. Or maybe it's taking a leap and over the summer signing up for a summer hang and just showing up to meet other people. Because just being there might be all that someone needs to encounter the divine. Or, you know, you could consider how you could expand how you spend your time either by signing up to serve on Sunday morning or out in your community. Serving other people, creating moments where someone else might have an experience with God is a beautiful way to choose a faith that is centered on others and not ourselves. So when we might notice that our faith is feeling a little shallow or that it's lacking challenge or lacking connection, I encourage us all to consider how we might push ourselves outside of ourselves and into community. Because that's where we find God, sitting at the center of the community that we form together. The third and final kind of spiritual expression we might encounter when re-engaging our faith and re-engaging God in our lives is a sentimental spirituality. Sentimental spirituality is what happens when we get so caught up looking back 
that we neglect to nurture the new things that God is doing as we move into the future. And if we keep reading in Haggai, even beyond um, where our scripture was today, we see him address the sentimental tension the community was facing. See, some of the Israelites who were helping to rebuild the temple, they had a memory of what life was like before. Either they were around before the first temple was destroyed, or they knew what life was like before then. They were raised with a memory. And so they remember how grand it was. They had memories of the way that folks gathered, how it smelled, how it sounded, how it felt to be there. Rebuilding for them was difficult because they were looking around at a temple that just felt different. It wasn't what it used to be, and they had a hard time imagining that it could ever be that significant or great again. And in response to that, God says this in Haggai 2.9. The latter splendor of this house shall be greater than the former, and in its place I will give prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. It'll be greater. I'll give prosperity to it. Carrying the memory of what used to be, struggling to imagine what could be, that is a very common, universal experience. Perhaps for you, you've been a lifelong churchgoer, and you fell in love with church as it was then. And while you're still deeply committed to your faith, maybe you're kind of struggling or grappling with the differences that you're experiencing in the church today. Or maybe, for you, you're coming into this space with previous experience, in a faith community or a church that was harmful to you. But faith is something you want to continue exploring. That relationship with God is significant, and so you're unsure of what the future holds for your relationship with God and your connection to the church. Or maybe you're entirely new to faith. Experiencing life with Jesus is brand new, and you're seeing these shifts in your life because of this new practice. Change, especially in our faith and spiritual life, is hard. We can love God and be deeply committed to our faith and still struggle with the fact that it might look different tomorrow than it does today. I think it's okay for us to wrestle with that. I don't believe that God is unaware of that challenge. And we're called to resist the urge to cling to sentimentality. To celebrate fond memories, yes. Feel inspired and grateful for them, absolutely. And we must turn our eyes to the new thing that God is doing in our midst. God extends to us the same promise that they did to the ancient Israelites. God promises that when we show up together, God shows up with us. Actually, experienced God showing up through my community in this way during my grand day of cleaning that I talked about earlier. So kind of following up with that, after I had spent the whole morning cleaning, and I spent an afternoon relaxing and reading and reflecting on the last few weeks, like I was feeling pretty recharged. I was feeling pretty grateful. Which was good, because I ended up receiving a call from a friend of mine who was kind of working through something, and they just needed to be with people who love them. So I gathered up the group, everybody headed over to my house, and we spent the night laughing and talking and crying and snacking, which is ideal anytime a group of people come together. And it was a really beautiful evening that we got to spend together. And when they left, I just, I had this whole moment of gratitude for God um, for, for stopping me in that morning to say, girl, you need to get your temple together because I'm coming over and I'm bringing friends. Now, I want to clarify, I don't think God was talking about my physical house. In fact, I don't think God really cared about the state of my physical house at all. Uh, It can be messy. That is not a problem. I do, however, believe that God had every intention of intercepting me at my house that night, that God was going to show up through my community And I was not in a spiritual headspace to be receptive, to be able to show up, to be able to be present, to be able to get outside of myself. Um, I needed to get my inner world in order. 
Just like the leaders in our story, I think God shows up for us through other people. And so when our our temple, our inner world, is out of order, be it because we're feeling stuck or self-focused or sentimental, God prompts us to find the people and to lean into rebuilding because God deeply wants a place to reconnect with you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for um, your spirit of disruption, even in moments where uh, we might struggle with it a little bit. Because it's often in those moments where you force us to pause, to look around, to take in the state of our inner world that we might see um, that we've been kind of shifting away, neglecting, or growing complacent in our relationship with you. We thank you that you are a God who desires relationship with us, that you um, love us so deeply and you offer us so much grace when that does happen, that you will bring people into our lives to help us reconnect with you. God, I pray that we would remember that our faith is not one to be lived by ourselves. It's not something that we tend to nurture privately, but that it is something we invest in amongst community, that you call us to a faith that is lived among other people, that you show up for us through others. I pray that we would find people who reveal you to us all week long and that we would be someone to reveal your heart to someone else this week. We lift all this up in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.